Today we're continuing our look at the life of King David. Last week we looked at how God's call shows us that when we are unqualified or disqualified, God can still use us for his purposes. Today we're looking at the most famous story from the life of David, the story of David and Goliath. And so the backdrop of the story really is a battle between the kingdom of Saul of Israel and the Philistines. The Philistines are a seafaring people that came from Crete and settled on the coastal plain on the Mediterranean coast. They're encroaching on the space that God has promised to Abraham, but that the Israelites have not yet conquered. If you look at a map of the promised land, you can see the red areas are the areas where the Israelites were actually occupying space, and the green areas are the areas that they'd been promised but were not yet controlling. Now, when you look at the map, you probably notice that the kingdom that Saul is ruling over is quite narrow. And so the Philistines know that if they can puncture the middle of that kingdom, if they can drive right through it, that they can cut the kingdom in two, and that Saul will be in a militarily indefensible position. And so Saul rightly regards their movement towards the center of his kingdom as an existential threat. And so the Philistines push into the foothills, and the Israelites go to meet them in battle. And it ends up, they meet at the Valley of Elah, which is sort of a wide plain of a valley with hills on either side. And it's a deadlock. Because for either of the armies to engage the other, they're going to have to descend off of the safety of the hill where they are, cross the plain, and try and climb the opposing hill while completely exposed to the enemy. It's a suicide mission, and so both sides just stand there and stare at each other. Now, in situations like this in the ancient world, there was a way of settling that, single combat. In single combat, each army would send a champion to fight it out. And whoever, the, the outcome of that battle would determine the outcome of the broader battle. That seems a little weird to us, but if you understand the assumptions that lie behind it, it does make some sense. You see, if a battle really is about the relative strength of the gods of the, of the nations that are warring, then if my god is more powerful than your god, my god can help my champion beat your champion just as much as my god can help my army beat your army. And so it kind of makes sense. And everybody's on board with this idea until they show who the Philistines offer in single combat. They have Goliath. And when King Saul sees Goliath, his theological convictions, well, he's not so sure about them after all. You see, theology, we often think of it as this boring academic discipline, but it really is just our beliefs about God and our beliefs about the way that the world works in relation to those beliefs about God. If you were to ask Saul, who's more powerful, Yahweh, your God, or Dagon, the God of the Philistines? He would say, of course, it's Yahweh. He's the creator of heaven and earth and all that. But when he is confronted with Goliath, the great disruption that really causes him to have to question whether or not that is true, he wavers in his faith. Saul falls for the temptation of seeing the battle as being between two men, one of whom is a towering individual who's going to be very difficult to defeat. If we look at Goliath, his assumption is also that it is his strength and his power that's going to be decisive in the battle. He curses David by his gods, but he doesn't, it seems to be like more of a, I don't know, a, a, a habit that he's into rather than a sincere belief. He just knows that he's bigger and badder than anybody he's ever faced and that he's going to be able to handle himself and he's going to be able to take on anybody who dares to challenge him. Enter David. David is a shepherd boy, and he is bringing provisions for his older three brothers that are in the campaign. And he comes to the battle line, and he hears the challenge that Goliath is issuing against the people. 
and he understands this defiance of Israel's army as a defiance of the God who stands behind Israel's army. So he starts asking about the rewards that King Saul is going to give. And, of course, he's attracted to that. But his brother Eliab misidentifies his nonchalance about the risk of fighting with Goliath as swagger. Word gets back to the king that David's talking about possibly going and fighting the Philistines, and David or and, and Saul calls for him. Now, the king is deeply skeptical about whether or not David can win in this battle, but he really doesn't have another choice. Nobody else is signing up to do this, and this has been dragging on for almost six weeks. And so he decides to let David try his chances. But, of course, Saul is thinking in human terms, and so he tries to give David his armor, because that's the kind of stuff. If you're a guy fighting another guy who has all those, that armor and weaponry is going to need. And David throws off the stuff. He says, you know what? I don't need this. I can trust in the preparation that God has already given me. Preparation that I learned as a shepherd who was looking after his father's sheep when there were bears and lions attacking them. And so he just grabs his shepherd's sling and his staff and five rocks, and he goes down to meet Goliath for battle. And that's where we pick up in the story in 1 Samuel 17, 41 to 51. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and to the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. Goliath's faith, his confidence, I should say, comes from his size and his strength. David's confidence comes from the size and strength of the God whom he represents in battle. God, David lives out his theological convictions that God is truly the greatest. Even when holding that belief and living out its natural consequences comes with tremendous risk to his personal safety. Now, when we look at this story in our own lives, I think we can sometimes relate, not necessarily to facing armed giants, but rather there are giants metaphorical in our lives. Disruptions that cause us to question if the things that we say are true are actually, you know, true. When we say prayer is powerful and then we encounter a situation in which all we can do is pray, do we feel powerful or do we feel powerless? When we say that God is my provider and then we encounter a situation in which our financial security is threatened, do we feel stressed or do we feel like we're okay because we've got God on our side. When we say that God transforms, equips, and heals, 
How do we respond when we are called into something for which we feel unqualified or disqualified? Do we say that couldn't possibly be God? Or can we trust that God's grace is sufficient for us to meet the challenge that he has called us to? Am I willing to live out my beliefs even when doing so leads to great risk for me? A few years ago, I uh, was talking to a friend of mine about how when Carolyn and I had moved home from Korea, we didn't know how we were going to make ends meet, but God provided for us. And I said to this friend of mine, I feel like God had me in this situation where I, there was nothing I could do but trust him, so that at some time in the future, when he called me out, that I would actually be able to choose to go out on a limb, because I had seen that God is faithful. And he said, well, it's funny you should say that. We were wondering if you could come work for us. Now, I had a full-time job in hotel marketing at the time, and I was offered a part-time job working for lower pay for a Christian uh, parachurch organization. And I didn't think I was going to be able to keep even part of my job, that I was going to have to quit my full-time job and take a part-time job. And I didn't know how we were going to manage that, but I really did feel that's what God was telling me to do. And so I swallowed hard, put those voices aside, and went to talk to my bosses and told them that I was going to take another job. And by the way, could I go down to part-time? And as it turned out, my bosses let me go down to part-time instead of me having to quit my job right then and there. And yeah, we, made, we had a pay cut, but we somehow managed to get through all of that financially, even though for a while I didn't know how I was going to. I know that it's easier to talk about how God is our provider than it is for us to actually live in the midst of having to prove that in our own lives. But faith is belief with consequences. If there are no consequences, it's not really faith. It's really just trivia. Faith means organizing our lives around the idea that Jesus Christ actually is Lord. Now, let's not be naive. That doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle or face disappointment, that bad things aren't going to happen on account of our obedience and our faith in God. If you believe that faith will save you from suffering or from hardship, then you haven't been reading Jesus. Jesus promises us that difficult things are going to happen in our lives. But he also promises that he will walk through them with us. And we also understand that no matter how we suffer, our response to that suffering, if we allow God to shape our response, can be folded into his plan. We just need to look at the cross where Jesus' humiliation and suffering and rejection became the greatest act of deliverance in all of human history. But it's easy when we're in the midst of those circumstances to question where God is. I imagine David had reason to question where God was in the middle of his circumstances. When you read the Psalms that he writes, you can see that he's a tormented soul. I could see that when he has to face down lions and bears in the normal course of his day, he might start to wonder where God was. Now, I've worked a lot of jobs. Some of them I didn't like very much, but I've never worked one where there was a genuine possibility that I might actually get eaten while doing it. And I think if it were me, I might say, hey, God, where were you when I faced the lion and faced the bear? Yeah, I mean, I guess I got out with my skin intact, but I really don't feel like you're on my side. You keep allowing these things to happen. Where are you? And if, if David asks those things to God, God might say, I was right there by your side, making sure that you had the skills you would need to fell a giant, because you never know, that might come in handy one day. God is at work in David, changing him into the king that Israel needs him to be. 
Do we trust that God is at work in our greatest challenges and frustrations and heartaches? Do we believe what we say about God? Or is it cheap theology? Theology that we hold up in our heads, but that never actually makes its way into our lived experience. Now, we have a lot of things that we like to say about God, words that we sing in the songs, and platitudes we like to exchange for one another. Are those things that we truly believe, that we would live out even if all the chips were down on the table? This week, I give you a challenge. Take one thing that you believe about God and live that out with reckless abandon, as if it really were true. If you say that God is, that prayer is powerful, then pray with expectation that God will move in the situation that seems impossible to you. If you believe that God is your provider, then stop stressing out about where your provision is going to come from. Instead, respond with generosity to the needs of others. If you believe that God is loving, then stop acting as if God hates you. Stop acting as if he's always disappointed with you. And instead, ask him that you could experience his love so that you can pass that love on to others around you. I think we're probably all guilty of some cheap theology. But I believe that if we learn these truths deep down in our bones, instead of just in our heads, that we'll live lives with far less stress and far less anxiety, and with a lot more love and peace. So we have a choice. Do we want to be like Saul, focused on the size of the giants that we face? Or do we want to be like David, focused on the size of the God who helps us face them?